Welcome to Recap! QQ here with producer Johnny D. This video is a special milestone for me because it's my 13th video. That means I've made more videos than Jonathan McIntosh and Feminist Frequency have since their Kickstarter campaign for Tropes vs. Women in Video Games. And it didn't even cost you guys 150 grand and a bundle of broken promises. So anyway, this recap will focus on the events surrounding E3. Grab your popcorn, there's gonna be a little bit more drama than usual. So E3 went off without a hitch. There were various levels of excitement or disappointment about the games announced, depending on who you talk to about it. In a move that startled nobody, big name AAA producers had this to say about Gamergate. That's right, they didn't say a single thing, which is how it should be, really. I mean, this is an industry event, and you don't talk about politics when you're trying to pimp a product, right? Well, the silence on the issue angered some folks, and not the people participating in the consumer revolt. International Business Times published an article scolding big publishers for not denouncing Gamergate by name. It cites our good friend Kate Edwards of the IGDA to set the tone for the article. The IB Times reporter went around asking big publishers what they were doing to make women feel safe. And much to their disappointment, instead of taking that opportunity to denounce Gamergate, the publishers instead chose to refer to some ESA boilerplate about how harassment is unacceptable. Hey, here's a thought. Maybe the publishers aren't denouncing Gamergate when asked about making women feel safe, because Gamergate has nothing to do with misogyny or sexism, and has everything to do with press corruption and censorship. So I have a theory here. I've been developing this theory for quite a while, but the pieces really fell into place after reading David Arbach's latest twit longer on Gamergate, which I'll put a link to in the description. My theory is that the gaming press wanted to create a villainous group that they were uniquely qualified to save the gaming industry from. A group of misogynists, racists, homophobes, and otherwise bigoted people. They wanted to be able to attribute all this bigoted behavior to one label, and then present themselves as the solution, the scalpel that would remove this cancer. Where they went wrong in their first attempt was, the name that they chose for this group of bigoted people was Gamer which was a label that many still held dear. Remember those Gamers Are Dead articles? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. In my view, that was them trying to make the term gamer into a dog whistle for every part of gaming culture that they viewed as toxic. But luckily, we all know how spectacularly they failed at that. But almost like a gift from the heavens, along came Gamergate. Now that has become their dog whistle for whatever they think is toxic. Someone acts sexist, racist, or homophobic? Well now, instead of saying, we need to remove these gamers, they can say, we need to remove these gators, even if the person had nothing to do with the consumer revolt. Their use of the term has become a classifier based off of traits. You have hair, mammaries, and a neocortex? Well, you're a mammal. You say sexist, homophobic, or racist things while being a gamer, you're a Gamergator. This is one reason why I think it's important not to adopt Gamergator as an identity. I think it's good that there's a certain amount of cringe associated with calling yourself a Gator or a Gamergator. Gamergate is not a club, it's not an identity that one adopts, and it's not a community even though communities have sprung up as a result of it. Gamergate is a series of events and scandals that resulted in a consumer revolt. The people are participating in the revolt because of Gamergate. We are not Gamergators, we are disgruntled gamers. We're reacting to Gamergate, and we're using the hashtag Gamergate to communicate. That's the extent of it. Once you start thinking like this and only applying the label gamer to yourself and rejecting other labels, it starts to become obvious how they're using Gamergator as the silly little dog whistle. They desperately want there to be a problem group in gaming that they can swoop in and save the industry from with their special social justice superpowers. Gamergator is the imaginary group that they've created to fulfill this purpose. Of course, the AAA publishers want none of this, so lovely, lovely crickets from them. Which in this climate is practically support. But even with Gamergate hardly being referenced at all at E3, there were some folks who were disappointed in the lack of attention that they were getting. Because the gaming industry is all about them, right? Three things cause social media outrage over E3. Violence, sexiness, and imaginary racism. First of all, let's talk about this guy who seems to enjoy spouting whatever will get him and his nonprofit feminist frequency some attention. Before I go on, let me point something out. This is Jonathan McIntosh's Twitter account. And this is Anita Sarkeesian's Twitter account. It's protected. This is not Anita Sarkeesian's Twitter account. This is the Twitter account of the feminist frequency nonprofit. Don't automatically attribute the things that this account says to Anita Sarkeesian. It may or may not be her, and often it just repeats the same sentiment that Macintosh displayed on his timeline right before. Now isn't that odd? 
So what was there for Macintosh to get all bothered about this time? Well, Bethesda had a presentation where they went back 20 years and brought back the awesome but senseless demon-slaying violence of Doom. Macintosh himself also went back 20 years and brought back the senseless argument of, Oh my god, Doom is too violent! This reaction was on display on both Macintosh's own account and the official Feminist Frequency account. His initial reaction was to claim that there's something deeply, seriously wrong with anyone cheering for the Doom trailer. He actually went back and deleted that tweet in what I can only assume is a moment of self-awareness that this made him sound even more out of touch with the gaming community than usual. He went on to say that having nothing but extreme violence in games is the epitome of modern game design. Yeah, modern game design. Because we totally weren't doing this in the 90s. <laughs> I'm bringing this up because of the reaction to his reaction. It's a great sign. He finally did it. He finally made Feminist Frequency say something so stupid that people are able to publicly criticize it without fearing backlash. The usual suspects like Total Biscuit and Adrian Kamirlash had their say, but even posters on Gamergazi expressed concern that Feminist Frequency's arguments were reductionist and lacking credibility. Even people working on Doom thought that this was hilarious, with one of the character artists bragging about it on Facebook as if it was a badge of honor, and another 3D artist sarcastically lamenting how, oh no, this will cause them to lose their core target audience. Aww. Violence wasn't the only ridiculous thing that triggered feminist frequency. Their attendee badge was too darn sexy as well. This tweet at least appears to actually be from Anita, as I don't think Macintosh's hands actually look like that. Of course, this set the more sex-positive feminists in opposition to them, with one of the people behind the Atheism Plus block bot stating that, quote, we need better people in the gaming feminism spotlight, end quote. No need to say or do anything here, folks. I mean, if they are capable of seeing how silly this is, just about anyone else should be able to as well. And once again, without any prompting from us whatsoever, these zealots are eating each other alive. So we've had violence, sexism, we're missing just one thing from the morality police trifecta of concern, and that's racism. So during Square Enix's E3 presser, when discussing the new Deus Ex game called Mankind Divided, the term mechanical apartheid was used. It appears that it's actually going to be a subject dealt with in the game, with the mechogs and the non-augmented being forced to live apart. The mechogs forced into ghettos, you get the idea. However, there is quite a bit of social media outrage over the use of this term, including from some writers for Leia Alexander's blog Offworld on Boing Boing. It's kind of funny. It's like they want gaming to grow up and address mature subjects, but not too fast. Almost like they want it to grow up in the way and at the rate that they dictate, while being influential consultants and speakers. Hmm. Anyway, it's time to meet Gilles Matuba, the game designer who worked with brand director André Vu to come up with the term mechanical apartheid, and who doesn't look anything like your typical white shitlord oppressor. He came to Kotaku in Action, the Gamergate discussion central on Reddit, to express his views on the outrage over the term that he coined. He was the game director of Deus Ex Mankind Divided at Eidos Montreal until September of last year. And his post was passionate and expressed that this term was not being tossed around lightly and that it was a subject that he and his team had researched extensively, that the story that they wanted to tell was something that was deeply personal to him, and that he felt like his identity was being erased by all these bloggers assuming that he was white due to being in game design. He asked for assistance in calling them out and exposing their stupidity. Yes, this is it! People in the industry are speaking to us without fear about the problems that they see in the games media and with games bloggers. And, well, it actually does look like his post on Kotaku in Action did get an attention boost. In an event that is surely a sign of the end times, Kotaku UK actually linked to the Kotaku in Action post in their article about the controversy. Mark Kern, influential game dev and president of League for Gamers, finally came out of the most transparent of closets as fully on the side of the Consumer Revolt participants. William Usher wrote an article about it. Ian Miles Chong of Game Ranks decided to advance the Doom Clock yet again by writing an article about it. And even the voice actor for Jensen, the lead character in Deuce X Mankind Divided, referenced it on Twitter. Backlash was minimal. The extent of the backlash was Polygon refusing to allow comments that link to the post due to Gilles' use of the offensive term SJW. No, I'm not joking. So let Polygon have its little hug box. If they don't actually want to keep up with the industry, they can feel what it's like to be replaced by 
those who do. The final big thing that happened at E3 is someone put up some anti-Anita Sarkeesian posters containing the Gamergate hashtag, and what I can only discern from their Twitter posts was an attempt to prove that communities organized around hashtags aren't sustainable due to the fact that anyone can act and then claim they were acting on their behalf. They failed for three reasons. First of all, their posters were not very well done. They used old memes and didn't provide any useful information at all, and no links to Deep Freeze or anything that the Consumer Revolt participant would actually link to. Second of all, the posters were really not that offensive. I mean, sure, the usual suspects will call them hateful, mean, spiteful, and indicative of the sexism problem in gaming, but posters exactly like this have been made targeting all sorts of public figures, from actors to politicians. Street art targeting public figures is nothing new or shocking. The third and final problem is, this street artist, whoever they may be, made the mistake of assuming that Gamergate is an identity or a community. It's neither of these things, and as such, an attack with the intent to smear a community is doomed to failure. I think we can pretty much ignore this street art as a failed experiment in agitation. So to summarize how E3 week affected the consumer revolt, well, it demonstrated that AAA publishers know not to piss off the consumer by making rash statements about Gamergate. It demonstrates that certain cultural critics can now be publicly criticized without backlash. And it demonstrates that developers can be openly in favor of the consumer revolt without being ostracized anymore. These are all excellent developments. This is great news. Very encouraging news. We need to stay the course, keep doing what we've been doing, and slowly but surely, things are going to change. Anyway, I didn't get to cover much more than the drama surrounding E3 this week, but Boogie Pop Robin did find another possible professional distance issue involving a Patreon relationship, this time between Laura Kate of Indie Haven and Louise James. I'll put it as the first link in the description. Thanks for joining us. It's time for me to sign off. I'll see you again next week, I hope. Ciao!